Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Bin to Table, a monthly food subscription service for folks who want to cook with the best pantry ingredients on the planet. Learn more at bintotable.com and use the code HRN at checkout to get $20 off your first month. This week on Meet and 3, we have stories about food in large quantities. From bulk buying groups and reasons for stocking up to creative solutions for handling excess waste. We have someone picking up our corks from the wine bottles and they repurpose them to make buoys for boats and, and, and like shoes and all these different things. Yeah, because of the COVID, uh, everybody like uh, isolated at home. But uh, to see the people face to face is still exciting. So we kind of treat it like a chance to say hello to the people and to the friend. Listen to Meet in 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Rupert Symington. We'll talk to Rupert about Port, Porto, the Douro, Symington family estates, and a lot more. We'll taste a 20-year-old tawny for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Rupert Simington is a fourth-generation port maker from a family of British and Portuguese origin dating back to the late 1800s. Rupert was educated in England and worked in finance there. Rupert Wade has made made his way to San Francisco and Chile before returning to the family business in Porto and the Douro in Portugal. He is the CEO of Simington Family Estates, overseeing four of the leading port houses, including Grams and Dow, along with 27 six quintas or vineyards making port and wine in the Douro and now in Alan Tejo. Welcome to the Grape Nation, Rupert. Hi, Sam. You know, we, you and I were supposed to sit down in person. I think it was in May. You had a pretty hefty U.S. tour um, with tastings and, you know, all kinds of market stuff. And obviously, because of COVID, everything was canceled. So we're doing a remote broadcast via Zencaster. And Rupert, you are currently in Portugal, right? Absolutely. Um, it was a um, great shame to have to cancel that great uh, visit back in May. We were going to celebrate uh, 200 years, um, of, sorry, 300 years of, of war and company, one of our companies, and, and um, Graham's would have been 200 years old this year. But anyway, we had lots of celebrations, all canceled. But hey, here we are. Yeah, yeah, trying to get back on our feet. All right, Rupert, I want to take a few minutes um, to talk about a few things. I want you to tell me about your journey in life in wine um, that got you 
currently to CEO of the family estates, Symington family estates, you know, so give me, I alluded a little that you were in Chile and San Francisco, but you know, give me the, the whole route and chronology. And then I want you to give me a brief history of Symington so that when we get into everything, everyone sort of has a frame of, you know, what we're talking about. So start with how you got to where you are. So um, I, I was born into a, a wine family and my father um, was very much responsible for the, the export markets, including the United States. And um, I, I spent my early life at home. Uh, we, we, a lot of our trade customers would actually stay at home with my parents or we'd go out to dinner with them. So I remember having a wonderful trip to the Douro with a gentleman called Terry Robards, who was a, the wine columnist for the New York Times. Yes. Um, great gentleman. And um, we had so much fun. And so, so I grew up around the wines, around the vineyards. Back then, we were a much smaller business. We had many fewer uh, properties in the Douro. But from my earliest memories, uh, we're visiting uh, Quinta de Bonfing at Pinghang, um, going up for the vintage. Uh, children were allowed at the vintage um, to, be, uh, to be seen but not heard. Um, so we had to skulk around in the kitchen while the uh, important trade visitors were entertained in the dining room. But um, it, it was, I have to say, I, I, I got to, uh, to understand and respect the Douro from a very early age. Um, as I progressed, I, I went away uh, to school in England and, and, and university. Um, I, I always had this intention and my father sat me down when I was about 16 and said, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I inherited shares in this business from my father. And, and if you're interested, you know, I, I would like you to, to, to follow in my footsteps. And I said, well, look, you know, what do I have to do? <laughs> so I, I, I spent some time. I, I worked in finance in London. Um, I went traveling uh, in Australia um, and met my wife in California, did a business degree in France. And, um, and, and when I was about, I suppose, 28, I moved back full time to, to this city and um, Joined the business. When, I was. Uh, when was that? In the early nineties. In you about ninety two, I came. Okay. Came back full time. So I'd been away. I, I grew up. I was here till about nineteen seventy seven, um, and then I came back full time in ninety two. But obviously, meanwhile, I'd spent a lot of vacation time here, and um, you know, I hadn't lost touch at all with the with what was going on. And and ninety two was a very interesting time because we were changing a little bit as a business. We were looking more at. Um, going downstream into the vineyards, controlling more of our own production. And um, from 92 to 2000, we, we, we expanded really quite quickly. So there was lots to do. I started working with um, four of my cousins of my, from my generation, plus uh, four of, my, uh, of the older generation. Um, and um, so we were a team of about um, eight or nine family members, but we have a sort of very good formula that we divide up the tasks between the, the family members. So none of us kind of tread on each other's toes. So I started, you know, I took over from my father, the U.S. Uh, market uh, commercial responsibility. Um, I also took over some of the, the family governance, um, you know, running the, the shareholder meetings and that sort of thing, which I enjoy. And um, yeah, and I, I uh, as my, my older uh, cousins gradually retired. Um, I moved up the ladder, and um, I think my my own um, my my own skill, if you like, I've I've tried to be I tried to keep abreast of every area of the business, not just you know one particular niche. So I've been trying to follow what's going on in production, following what's going on in in bottling, in in, in vineyard development, um, in in, um, in in wine stocks, etc. So. I think I was, I'm, I'm in quite a good position to be CEO because I do have a, a pretty broad vision of the company. Right, um, that's, what, that's what it takes, a knowledge of everything. A, a lot of businesses of our sort, you know, they, they get to a point where they, they simply don't have the talent pool um, and they have to, you know, bring in outside CEOs. And that, that's very common and very normal. I think we have been blessed, um, certainly in, in the fourth generation, my generation, we were blessed with four or five very able um, uh, individuals and um, I've really enjoyed working with my cousins. Um, it's been a pleasure, you know, to have this common goal. We haven't had 
too many fights. Um, <laughs> right, which a, is <clears throat> usually the problem. Yeah, I've just been watching Succession on Netflix. and, and wow, um, <laughs> You bet. You, know. <laughs> you don't watch it. <laughs> Uh, no, but it, it, it's a, so it's been it, it's a big responsibility. I mean, I think you know uh, I, I became a director of the company back in in the early '90s, and I so I haven't really progressed from a ca- career point of view hugely. And that's the da- the downside of a family business is that you don't there's nowhere any, re, there's nowhere you can really go. <laughs> but um, that, as long as you love an, what you do, and, and uh, that's an interesting insight. Um, all right, so you know a couple things. It's interesting because. Um, before you came back in 92, it sounded like a nice family business, um, with the family involved and some nice holdings. Um, and as you alluded, I guess from 2000 on the growth has been amazing and the holdings are amazing, you know, from brand names to property, to the amount of Quintas. And, you know, I hope we'll get into that a little, but before we start talking about, you know, specifically the wines in the areas, just, you know, give me a little family history. The Symingtons got into this. The, the port business has been around longer than the Symingtons, but the Symingtons jumped into this. You know, take me from that, you know, to current. So um, the, the, the first Symington came here in 1882, um, my great grandfather, Andrew James. And he was a, a young Scotsman. His family had been, you know, industrialists in Scotland. Um, he was well educated, but he um, uh, unfortunately there'd been a, a financial disaster that wiped out the family fortune. So he came out here pretty much with without a penny to his name wow. uh, to work with virtually for the Graham family, who were family friends back in in Glasgow in Scotland. And um, he soon the Graham's at that time was a textile producer with a port arm. And he, he worked for initially for the textile business, but he soon branched out. He didn't actually work. He left Graham's and, and went into the port trade. And he built uh, himself a, a, a reputation. Uh, he, he did some deals for the government um, uh, in, to get rid of distressed port stocks. And um, he ended up buying uh, from the War family, uh, one of the oldest families in the port trade, he, w- he took a, W-A-R-R-E, right? Exactly. He, he, he took over there their Porto production branch, because back then a lot of port shippers had their offices in London and they had a, a production arm here. So he bought right. outright wars um, in about 1912 and um, with it came to de Bonfin, uh, which is still our family home and base in the Douro. And he had three sons who, who followed him into the business. They, they managed to buy out the, the Dow brand, from which was also, curious enough, owned by the War family at the time. And by the 1950s, they um, they owned these two brands. At the time I was born, it was it was Dow and War were our family brands. Uh, in 1970, uh, my father and his cousins managed to buy Graham's, which was a you know it was a, an icon of the port trade, particularly in the vintage port world. Uh, it was a, a brand that had had been underinvested uh, for a number of years. And um, anyway, it, um, it, it, it was a, a trophy. Uh, we had to do a lot of work and put it back on the map. So that's the, you know, the third generation added the third brand, if you like. And then we were lucky enough in 2006 to be, uh, we, we were approached by Beam, who'd recently bought the, the Coban Port brand as part of the Allied Domecq uh, portfolio that they bought. Ah, um, and they they approached us to set up a um, a deal where we acquired the production assets and produced Coben's port for them. So they kept control of the brand, but we would do we would take over all the stocks and the vineyards. Um, so we, we took all over, over all of the part that we that we were good at, which is you know winemaking, vineyard management, and they kept right. the brand. And then about it was at the beginning of the financial crisis, they came back to us and said, "Well, look, you know we're not." really interested in this, this brand doesn't really fit our, our long-term strategy. You know, how about we, we go back to where we were in 2006 and what would you have offered us for the whole lot? So they basically sold us the brand, um, wow. which was great. And, and this was, you know, I have to say that this was the brand when I was a kid, these were the guys with the, the directors had the chauffeur driven cars and the, you know, this, <laughs> this was a bit it's like, funny. You remember that. Yeah. It, it's a bit like sort of, you know, um, 
I don't know, Dry Creek Vineyard buying Gallo. You know, it was a, it right. was a, um, a, a, a funny twist of fate, you know, that, that uh, my grandfather had been a great friend of Reg Cobb, who's the, the owner and director of Coburn's. And um, it was inconceivable that Symington would have ever been big enough to, um, to, 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 to buy Coburn's. But anyway, we ended up with a, a brand which, you know, with a lot of history, um, it's the biggest brand in the, in the UK market, particularly. Right. And it has the iconic Special Reserve, which is probably the best, the wide, most widely sold um, uh, brand in the, uh, in, the, in the reserve category. Um, so, so we did take a big leap. It, it was a big financial leap as well. It was a we had right. to borrow a lot of money, but but it was you know, uh, I, I think you know looking back, you know, fourteen years later, um, you know, it was I, I, it was a good it, business decision. It was a great. I just rode up in the car just now with my cousin Paul, who is now retired, but he and I and, and our cousin Johnny, you know, the three of us, put together the deal and and you know delivered it to our shareholders. And I think it was one of the best things we ever did. It shows you how an old you know port. It's definitely perceived by people as being around for hundreds of years, how the history, you know, the change in the acquisition is fairly current. I mean, you know, all this happened not that long ago. Um, Rupert, I don't think I think I said this before. I don't think I could think of anybody better than you to help me and help my listeners get a little primer or education on how port is made. Um, so before we get into, you know, the specific brands, I want you to help me. I don't think decipher, but explain um, about port. So let's start with the vineyards. All right. So people think of port um, as a drink from port, Porto in Portugal. Um, but the vineyards are very unique and they're located east of Porto in the Douro. Correct. Take me from there. So um, originally when port was first made popular back in the the end of the 17th century, um, port was generally uh, known as as a wine from the coast. And then as people, uh, as people's, you know, consumption increased, they they went up river and about an hour and a half uh, by car today. And what was then back then a, a day and a half by on muleback up the river, it's about 60, 70 miles up the river, uh, they found these monks growing uh, vineyards and and grapes that were, had a much higher natural level of sugar. They were, basically, there's a, there's a sort of mountain range running north, south, parallel to the coast of Portugal. And, and it creates a rain shadow. So if you go behind, beyond those mountains, you get into a, what's technically a semi-desert um, and obviously, if you don't give vines enough water, they tend to produce a lot less fruit, but the fruit is a lot more concentrated. Anyway, right. the, the resulting wine that were they, they, they found and transported from that region was uh, hugely better than the stuff from the coast. And it became uh, almost a sort of uh, a, an overnight success. The first shipment support from the upper, upper Douro uh, kicked off what was, you know, almost a gold rush. People poured into the region. And for the next hundred years, port just grew and grew and grew to become uh, the most consumed and the most expensive wine in the world. I mean, it was extraordinary to think of it today. It's a, you know, quite a, in a you know, a, a small part of the whole wine world. But right. one of the things that made port different was this um, higher level of sugar, natural sugar in the grapes, Turns into a higher level of finished alcohol in the in the in the fermented wine when you ferment it dry, and that acts as a natural preservative. So these wines were they did last longer than the a French red or something, which back in those days, you know, you, you could keep it in the barrel for maybe two or three months, but after that it would turn to vinegar. Right. Whereas port um, had naturally a a a better track record. Um, and they went one step further. They, they, because it was a bit further to take wine from Portugal to, uh, to the UK, which is the biggest market back then, than it was from France, there was a practice called fortification where they dashed the wine with brandy. They put, put a bit of brandy into the, into the cask of port before it sailed, and that act as a, acted as a preservative. It killed off any, any yeast that might provoke a, a, a secondary fermentation uh, so the, the wine basically wouldn't turn into vinegar. 
And this today is how we make port. We, we add uh, a, a brandy spirit, uh, which allows us to, um, uh, you know, arrest the fermentation, uh, keep some of that natural grape sugar. So port, port, port has no natural, has no sweetness added to it. It's just natural grape sugar. So if you have a glass of port, you say, oh gosh, this is sweet. It, it's the same sweetness that, you know, that you would have had if you'd had a glass of grape juice. It's not, it's not added. Right. Um, so uh, a couple of quick questions. When you moved towards port for the grapes, they were initially growing the grapes closer to Porto and they were growing it closer. And were they different types of grapes? I, I think they were. I mean, I think, the, you know, Warren Company started in 1670 uh, in actually in Vienna, which is a, a, a town about an hour north of here. Um, uh, and it Basically, wine tended to come from places where you could get ships close to the right. vineyard because wine is heavy. Um, and I think the, the, the Douro came quite late in the history of wine because it was very difficult to transport the wine out of the Douro. Uh, well, well ta- port, port merchants ta- managed... Sorry, carry on. I didn't mean to interrupt. But t- talk about that when you finish your thought, because uh, you may have said it, but the mount, the, the vineyards are incredibly hilly and that makes it difficult to farm. And, you know, I guess the hilliness, the altitude, all of that has the effect on what grape and, you know, what type of, you know, wine comes out of that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, if you look really at the history of port, it's almost miraculous that port was ever invented in the first place, because <laughs> to establish vineyard in the Douro, you have to build, you know, these steep, steep slopes. You, you Originally, you had to build a stone wall, fill that, that wall with earth, plant a varietal, um, hope that it grew because there's, there's very little rainfall there. You probably have to water it, carry water up from the river. Um, and, and then having transported the the grapes by mule to the local winery which was basically a couple of stone tanks in the middle of a of nowhere you'd then have to transport the made wine uh, on donkey back to the river and they the port merchants the early port growers employed these flat bottomed wooden boats transport boats barges almost um, that would float the wine down the river to a porto where it could be put on the larger ocean-going vessels. So the whole logistics of the port trade was just ridiculously complicated. And I think this, you know, I alluded earlier to port having been one of the the most famous and most expensive wines in the world. That profit that was possible, you know, paid for a lot of the logistics that, you know. It was necessary. And they say that, you know, thousands of, of, um, stonemasons were brought in from um, Galicia um, in Spain um, and they were known for their, their skills as stonemasons. Galicia at the time was very, very impoverished. So the Douro had, I don't know, someone calculated literally thousands, tens of thousands of miles of dry stone walling was created to, to, to make the terraces for the port uh, vineyards. Um, and I, I think someone said if you if you took them all, put them end to end, it would wrap around the world a couple of times. You know, it was, wow. it was that ama- amazing it, amount of labor. It's um, an ama- it's an amazing sight. You know, when you're at any one high point and look, you know, both ways, and then just going up and down the river. Um, while we're talking about the vineyards, you know, which in reality is farming and growing a fruit, um, talk to me about your vineyard practices. Um, you know, practicing organics, how important is sustainability? How do you, you know, execute those things? Well, we're very, I mean, for, for many, many years, we've been using uh, a, a local standard of minimum intervention. So <clears throat> we, we've been trying to respect the, you know, the soil, the, the landscape. Uh, luckily, where we are, one of the upsides of having a very dry climate is that we don't have a lot of problems with, you know, bugs and, and, and weeds to the extent and that they do in other regions. Um, and what we have got a substantial holdings now of, of fully uh, organic vineyard where we, you know, we, we go by the, the rules and there are certain, obviously certain products that you, you absolutely can't use any uh, weed killers or, 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 or insecticides and, and you can only use 
to treat the vineyard certain recommended um, traditional um, chemical treatments. Um, and, and that's, I think we all love it. I mean, it, inevitably, organic vineyard is more expensive uh, to, to, to maintain. And, um, but we have had some success. We, we now make uh, a, a small amount of organic port, but a rather larger amount of, of fully organic uh, table wine. Um, and uh, that, that's, a, you know, it's hugely satisfying really to, 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 to know what's being done. In all the other vineyards that aren't organically farmed, as I say, that it's to all intents and purposes, you know, we're not, we're not putting anything nasty in there. So they, they probably could be organic, but then going through the certification process t- tends to be a little bit challenging. So we, we, we are passing more and more vineyards slowly to, to fully organic uh, status. Right. Um, you, you know, I, I read something interesting. Is it true that each family member, and, you know, as you said before, there's a bunch of active members in the family and the business, farms their own vineyards, and each port comes from individual vineyards? Um, it, 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 each family member has uh, created, you know, uh, 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 or has bought a vineyard of their own. Um, and uh, my father bought a vineyard back in 87, which I now share with him. And, you know, it's, it's a modest, uh, uh, we, we work in pipes, which are barrels of port. So you, you measure a vineyard by the right. number of pipes, barrels it produces. Very archaic, but quite useful if you know the language. Um, but in, in, in all honesty, the, the um, uh, most port is still um, non, non-vineyard specific. Port is um, a bit like um, champagne, where there is right. some vineyard specific wines, but the vast majority of port is, uh, you know, comes is made from grapes grown by thousands of farmers in the region. Right. Uh, what, what we've tried to do um, with our vintage ports, uh, our top end ports, they're 100 percent now from our own properties. Um, that allows us much more control over when to pick, when to, you know, the treatment during the year. We can guarantee to produce you know, fabulous grapes. Um, but we still have some great farmers who we support. I mean, the, the Doro is a, you know, it's, it's a one, a one crop, uh, territory town, town exactly. Yeah. There, there isn't yeah. really anything else you can do there. There's a few olive trees and a few almond trees, but they don't really produce the economic benefit of the Doro is 95% down to the, to the wine. Um, and, um, so, so we do. We are conscious. We want to support farmers, and, and as nice as it would be to to make all our port from all our own vineyards, I think we'd have to have a uh, a size of property. We'd be the probably the biggest landholders in Europe if we if we had to do that. And as nice so, as that would be, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> so, um, so that that's a good thing. You're able to make your high end ports with, I guess you could say, estate grown grapes, and you're able to support you know the farmers and the communities for the demand, you know, for other, you know, bottlings, correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and, and yeah. more and more we, we realize, you know, we, we've, there are some structural problems in the Duro, you know, farmers' incomes are, are not going up, unfortunately. Um, and we, we just can't, you know, we can't just pay indefinitely higher and higher prices because obviously there has to be a, a price at which we buy grapes. You know, we can't go to the, the U.S. consumer and double the, the prices of our right. wines, and, and, you know, but, but there's a sort of, I think we're seeing now the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, there are farmers. I think there's the trouble of the Duro. There's been a lot of what we call weekend farmers, people who who have a piece of land and they they don't, you know, they don't pay themselves any money. They just go and farm right. it at the weekend and they deliver the grapes. And and those sort of people, you know, they're not going to survive because once they don't have the, you know, they could never afford to put someone in to do it for them. Um, right. So so um, right. Yeah, so, well, so from that point of view, it's 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 a bit you know, unfortunately, a bit um, you know, a bit precarious. But 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 we we became a, a B corporation last year, which is you know, it, it's an international standard of of you know, where a, a company, you know, we actually change our articles of association to 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 actually, you know, we have a pledge that we will try and respect our suppliers, our customers, our our community, and and uh, you know, we're working quite hard to. To, to, to change the things in the Duro to make it to make it better for everybody, and that's called a B Corp 
Pretty certification. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned grapes, and it would be hard not to talk about port without talking about grapes. Um, you know, people who know wine but don't get nerdy about it don't realize that there's a whole set of grapes you know, that port is made from that maybe the average guy never heard of. Um, talk to me about the grapes used to make port, you know, the grapes you're committed to growing, you know, in the Douro. Um, give me some so, names. So, so we have a, a bunch of pretty strangely named uh, grapes in the Douro. I, I like to say that they're, they've all evolved um, pretty much as, as hybrids of the original vines that the Romans brought from Italy across France and Spain and eventually planted in Portugal. Um, you know, it, it's well documented that the Romans were the ones who propagated uh, vine growing um, outside Italy. And um, I think the, the common thread of these varietals that we have today, there are something like 50 different varietals around in the Douro, but we've chosen of the, of the red varieties, we have five or six that we really like and we think can really deliver the right quality. And, and we don't bottle any of them on their own as port. We always blend them. But um, names like Tariga Nacional, Tariga Franca, uh, Tinta Barocca, uh, Tinta Rorige, Tinta Caun, Tinta Morella, these are, are varietals. They each have, I mean, for each one, I, th I, I, I like to describe Trigger Nacional is a bit like our Cabernet. It, it doesn't taste like Cabernet, but it's it's a structured, right. very dark, and and it's the wine with a lot of a lot of sort of good acidity and firmness. Trigger Franca is maybe a bit a bit more like Merlot. It's a little bit softer, a little bit softer. more. Um, um, and then Tinta Barocca is a bit like Zinfandel. It's high in alcohol, uh, thin skinned, um, and and they all give their contribution. The nice thing about the Douro is we don't no two harvests are the same. We have Weather conditions can be absolutely, totally different from year to year. So, and in different conditions, different varietals do better or worse. So, we, if you like, there's no formula, there's no recipe uh, to for the uh, for the varietals that we use. Uh, and um, you know, we, we do sort of um, uh, we do kind of plant new ones. We've got Alicante Boucher from um, as a new varietal. We we plant a little bit of um, Sozang, uh, which is a a, a vignuvered, a red vignuvered grape um, that we that we actually have great results with in the Douro. So we're always experimenting, but the, there's a core of of maybe five or six varietals that do ninety percent of the donkey work. And the blending for each port, vintage to vintage, varies by grape percentage, right? Exactly, depending on which which grape varietals have done better. So right. this, the, the harvest that just finished, we, we had an absolute wipeout. We had intense heat just for the harvest. And all the Tariga Franca crop was uh, affected. We lost about 50% of our of So our you'll, crop see, that, you'll see less Tariga Franca in that vintage, In the 2020s, right? unfortunately, yeah. we just, you know. So um, you have to tweak it where you could stay true to some type of house style, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we, that, there we can, you know, we can... Say so Graham's, we typically stop the fermentation a little bit sooner, so you keep more of the natural grape sugar. So Graham will naturally be a little higher, in, higher, a sweeter style of port. Dow, on the other hand, we let it go the opposite way. We'll, we'll ferment a bit drier, let it ferment a bit longer, so there's a little bit less residual sugar right. um, and, and a drier finish. And so, so that you can tweak the house style, and then obviously the the properties that go into Dow and Graham, the top wines, will give their signature to the wine so even in a a tricky year from a climactic point of view that the sort of style of the wines underlying style will be the same just the right. varietal mix will be different before we take a break i want to talk about one last thing pertinent to all of this and that's how the wine is made um and your cellar practices um how much different is it to make port than other wines and foot treading, which I don't know if people know about, is something that's essential to making port. Tell me about that and some of the changes coming that way. So um, winemaking has been, I mean, the original winemaking method was, um, was foot treading. That was the Roman practice where grapes were hand carried down the hill uh, in baskets and tipped into 
open uh, stone troughs about maybe about uh, 10 foot uh, by, by, by 15 foot um, square um, and maybe about three and a half feet deep. And that would be the grapes would be put in whole uh, at the end of the day, a team of about 10 or 12 people would jump into the, into the, the, <laughs> the stone tank and, and foot stomp those grapes for about three hours uh, until the fermentation, the skins had been broken down. And then the, but the obvious, not to interrupt, the obvious question is why wouldn't you press them? Uh, well, I think this was, you know, we, we didn't have um, Tra- tradition yeah. in history. Yeah, well, we, we, we didn't have electricity in the Dura until the 1970s. So okay. you know, pr- pr- prior to that, you know, there was, yeah. you know, there was no mechanical um, methods available uh, and people just did it the way. And it makes great wine. I mean, there were there were people there also. They lived out in the farms. They 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 were quite happy to do a bit of extra work after they'd had their evening meal after picking. And, um, mm-hmm. and believe it or not, we still make wine like that at our Quinta de Vesuvio. In fact, we didn't. For the first time ever this year in 2020, we didn't make the wine that way because of COVID. But uh, un- until 2019, we've been, you know, making wine in in the time honoured way. Um, we we made some advances. You know, we de-stem the grapes before we put them in the tank, and we cool the tank down to to help it, you know, help keep the, the freshness in the in the in the wine. But otherwise, what happened in the 60s when it became a vain, you know obvious that we weren't going to be able to have a future uh, making 100% of the wine of the Duro by foot treading. We invested, actually Dow was one of the first wineries in 1964 to put in a pump over uh, method, uh, ah. more like a, a modern, a brilliant machine developed by an Algerian uh, Frenchman um, called the Les, Les Sols method. And it's almost like a coffee percolator where the CO2 generated by the fermentation is used to drive the fermentation pump over. So it's a no, a no energy, uh, self, uh, self-energizing process. Absolutely brilliant. But when you next come, Sam, I'll show you the machine, but I'm not going to try and. I would uh, love to see that. Does yeah. that resemble in any form what other winemakers do with carbonic maceration? I, I think believe, um, I, I think it's pretty unique. You know, it's, it's yeah. quite an, it's quite an aggressive pump over, you know. It, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it sounds to, different. I haven't seen it made, you know, used anywhere else in the world. And I know they stopped yeah. using it. They had a bit in yeah. North Africa, but it was considered. But anyway, more recently, we've developed a a, a substitute for foot, foot treading, which is a an automated lagar. So we've replaced the people who foot stomped with uh, a hydraulically driven feet, and these basically apply the same pressure on the skin so they don't break the seeds they just interesting and and, and that's been a brilliant brilliant invention we make some of our best wines that way today interesting um rupert we have to take a quick break um when we come back i want to talk to you you know specifically about the brands and the wines um i'm talking to rupert simmington rupert is the ceo of simmington family estates um the great port maker Um, You're listening to The Grape Nation. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Bin to Table, a monthly food subscription service for folks who want to cook with the best pantry ingredients on the planet, founded by Ben Simon. After working for President Obama, Ben spent five years traveling the world for Greenpeace, campaigning on climate change and sustainable agriculture. He always kept his eye out for delicious food to bring back home. Now, with everyone's travels on hold and home cooking more important than ever, Ben's subscriptions provide a way for home cooks to experience different food cultures each month and put together nourishing, delicious meals with the best pantry items on the planet. With Taste the World, get a new shipment of different best-in-class ingredients to explore a new cuisine each month, along with tips and tricks to help out. We're talking delicious single-origin spices, cold-pressed olive oil, beautiful sauces, and lots of ways to use them. There's also an essential subscription which gets you a delicious assortment of heirloom, hard-to-find recipe staples. You can also get both each month with the full Bend to Table box subscription. 
Learn more at bentotable.com and use the code HRN at checkout to get $20 off your first month. And Bent to Table will donate $10 to HRN. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, Rupert Simington. Rupert runs Simington Family Estates with his family. Um, Rupert, we talked about Port, how it's made the region and all of that. Now let's talk about your brands. There are some revered, venerable brands. Um, I think the cornerstone, cornerstone flagship is the Port. You have four Port houses. Um, please tell me, you know, who they are again. You've mentioned them during the show, but let's talk about them. And j- just give me a little brief difference. Like in the the port itself, you talked about the difference between, you know, Dow's and Graham's. You know, what other nuances or subtleties, you know, with each of the houses? So um, we, we Graham's is obviously, I think, our, our flagship brand. Okay. It, it, I'm, I'm hoping even, even through COVID, um, as of the last figures I saw, I'm hoping that Graham uh, is is uh, it will have grown in the U.S. this year by about uh, over 10 percent, which is amazing. Uh, just shows really? that when people when people are at home, they do they do wicked things like drinking port. You know? <laughs> um, but um, uh, and that makes pro- it probably the most uh, the most the biggest uh, brand in the U.S. now by value. And it, that is re- reflected across our whole port- portfolio. It's the, the brand that we probably have, you know, it's, it's, it's more, more exposure, more, more, um, more, more fine, fine dining associated with the brand. But we also right. have a, you know, a healthy base of, of luckily of, 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 of retail distribution. Uh, Graham tends to be a sweeter, richer, uh, perhaps, a, you know, a, a more lush style of port. Um, it's stable mate Dow. Uh, typically would be a little bit drier, uh, a bit more muscular, lean um, in, in a Dow vintage port. Quite often you could be, you know, you could have the first sip and it's sweet, but it finishes almost like a Bordeaux. You know, it's almost like a dry right. wine. You almost no no lingering sweetness. Um, and then Coburn, uh, the new the newest kid on the block for us. Um, the new a, the new old kid. Well, exactly. Um, Coburn was was. Um, was added to the family stable only in 2010. Um, and that, that's got a, also on the drier side, <clears throat> but it sources a lot of its fruit from the upper Douro. The Douro runs east-west uh, through the Spanish plain, and it, it goes through the Douro Valley, a mountainous Douro Valley, when it reaches Portugal. And Coburn tends to source, has a lot of properties and sources a lot of grapes from upstream sort of closer to the Spanish border where, where it's hotter and drier. So you get definitely more of a, quite often a sort of Kirsch cherry stone um, right. quality in the wine, also a little bit drier. Um, and it's also a big proponent of the, uh, the Trigue Nacional variety, which is um, actually Coburn's almost single-handedly rescued in the Douro in the 1970s. Uh, it, was, it was a varietal that almost disappeared from the Douro in Coburn. Is it a higher... Is there a higher blend of the Nacional and the Coburns? In the Coburn vintage, definitely. We have a, yeah. a, a dominant percentage of Triga Nacional right. in almost, almost every vintage now. Um, right. And then, not last but not least, is War, um, one of my personal favorites. Um, War Why? Has, uh, War has a sort of a, 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 a winery that's cooler, higher up in the hill, and a vineyard, some vineyards that are higher up, and it, it, it makes very floral, very sort of flowery and, and, ah. and fruit, fruit forward wines uh perhaps not not as chunky as as a dow but but you know amazingly elegant and 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 lifted um and uh i'm drinking at the moment out of preference um uh, i i took home a, a case of 94 vintage and the wine is absolutely phenomenal i mean it's just it's, it's, perfect age you know it, it was same age as my son hugh is 26 years old and um, it, it's just spectacular. I mean, if, you know, for drinking today, I, I, there's nothing better. Um, so there, there's kind of a port within, you know, Symington for every type of style and taste. Tell me about, you're also making non-port wines, right? I mean, a lot of the Quintas are, are making wine. Um, has that been a growing thing through the years? 
Absolutely. I mean, we, we um, as as we grew our vineyard holdings uh, throughout the um, the nineties and two thousands or noughties, as they call them, uh, we 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 came up with a a challenge, which was um, in the in the port trade or in the Douro, there's a law that each vineyard has only a certain uh, volume that it can make into port. Anything else grown over and above, or any, any kilos over and above the limit, uh, would have to be fermented into dry wine. And uh, th- this was, uh, as we added vineyard holdings, we were growing more and more quality grapes that weren't allowed legally to be made into port. So in, in 1999, actually, I led a, uh, a team to, to kind of develop um, some dry wines and and we didn't have a lot of experience. In fact, we had no experience of making quality reds. We made some sort of reds as, as secondary out of the, right. the leftover grapes, but but nothing that we were really very proud of. And um, one of the things uh, we we did, we we had a friendship with the Pratt's family who had recently sold Cos Destonel. Um, we, we were together Legendary. in this wonderful group called Pr- Premium Family Vini, along with the Antinoris and others. Um, and uh, Bruno Pratz uh, agreed to come and work with us in '99 to try and develop a, a, a an equivalent to vintage port in a dry red. So we gave him, you know, free access to our top grapes from our top vineyards, uh, Malvedas, Vesuvio, Bonfin, um, and we we made uh, experimental wines in '99. And in 2000, you know, we launched Crisea, which was an absolute overnight success. You know, it was a a really you know, big uh, black strap uh, quality uh, red wine from the region made from the top grapes. So I think we, you know, we started off, we had a lot of luck. We, we started off, I think, at the right end. We also right. developed a more commercial range, which probably took a, a bit longer to get going. But I'm happy to say that <clears throat> today uh, I'm looking at for this year, we will sell over 200,000 cases, nine liters of, of, of dry reds from the Douro this year, wow. dry reds and whites, which will be a record for, for my family. Now, one last thing. Um, you've always worked out of Porto and the Douro, but the family recently expanded into another very interesting region of Portugal called Alentejo. Tell me about that quickly. So th- we've been sort of looking at, you know, we've got, we've all had, had, all our eggs firmly in one basket. We had, um, we, we've had an investment in Madeira for some years, but other than that, we, we haven't had any vineyard owning ownership outside the Douro Valley. So we thought, as a hedge, you know, we should look at some diversification. Anyway, about four or five years ago, we we had the opportunity um, to acquire a, a very significant forty hectare vineyard um, in a two hundred hectare property in in the. Uh, in this curious mountain range east of Lisbon called the Serra de San Mamed. It forms pretty much the border between Spain and Portugal. And um, it's a vineyard shelf, uh, a bit like um, you get in Napa Valley. It's a flat bit of land about 500 meters up from the from the, uh, the plain. Um, and, and on it is a, a wonderful vineyard. It's pretty, pretty flat um, where we have Cabernet, we have Syrah, we have um, Alfa Sheru, the Corato. We have right. um, uh, some about ten percent white grapes, including Arinto um, and Verdelio. And, and we've we've been making uh, since two thousand and seventeen some really spectacular wines. I mean, we we literally bought it without any stock. Uh, we bought a vineyard and a winery and a property. We didn't know what the potential of the wines would be. So there was an element of gambling. But right. I'm really pleased, you know. It, what, it's Rupert, shows... what is the name of the uh, vineyard? We, we call it Quinta de Font Soto, uh, which means... S-O-U-T-O? Uh, S-O-U-T-O. It's, it, right. it means the, the source of the Soto stream. And a Soto is a, is a chestnut grove. And the, the property is covered in chestnut trees. Where, where there aren't vineyards, there are chestnuts. And um, we, we thought it was a... We, we changed the name because we, we didn't buy the, the brand. We just bought the, the property. Um but right. um, and and the original name of the property was was something unpronounceable. So, um, <laughs> but, but I'm very pleased actually, and I I think it's a model that you know in the fullness of time, you know we'd like yeah. to repli- replicate in other regions. I mean, there's so much in Portugal that's wonderful, and yeah. I have to say th- this is 
by far the best area of the Alentejo. It's high, it's cool, it's got schistous soils. It's much more akin to what we do in the Douro than the rest of the Alentejo, which is, you know, Alentejo makes great wines, but a lot of them are from much higher yielding vines and, and you know, much yeah. more commercial uh, styles. So, you know, we've, we've, we've picked a fantastic terroir. So, so watch this space. I think it's Look, be looking, great. looking forward to tasting that. Um, Rupert, I do a thing called the wine list where I ask all my guests about their wine preferences. We'll do that in a minute, but I have a couple of questions, more than a couple, um, that I want you to answer quickly. Um, what is the right temperature to serve port to enjoy? I would say, you know, room temperature, you know, I, I can't remember what it is in, in Fahrenheit, but 16 degrees. Um, I'll, I'll convert know. that. Okay. Six so degrees, 16 degrees six, Fahrenheit. Centigrade. So, so uh, centigrade. You know, I, I would right. say, you know, room temperature or um, in the case of a tawny, I, I like it maybe a little cooler in the summer, you know, it's a little okay. touch of, you know, what white wine temperature is probably perfect in the summer. Now, so. tell, diff tell people the difference... I mean, you're not confused, but people sometimes look at port and they look at sherry and they go, oh, those are two sweet things. Aren't they the same? Um, what's the difference between port and sherry? Well, sherry is, is made almost entirely out of white grapes um, and, right. and port is made almost entirely out of red grapes. So red that's, grape. <laughs> that's a good, a good start. <laughs> right. But the, um, they share the heritage that both, both were fortified wines really created uh in order to help the wines travel um but that's where the similarity ends is, um is sherry, sherry is sherry heated rupert i don't believe so no 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 i think okay. that's just madeira um okay just madeira but i All think right. sh sh sherry is you know is fermented off the skins um using this strange yeast called floor which floats on ah. the top of the uh, whereas port, we use um, wild yeasts uh, naturally right. present on the skins, right. and obviously we have a lot of skin contact. Uh, all the flavour in a in a port grapes uh, is is in the skin. So we've got to, you know, really use a very aggressive. The, these small grapes, drought drought stricken grapes, are very low on juice and very the skins are very thick. So it takes a lot of work to get all that colour and flavour out of the skin. So we, we right. have to work it pretty hard. And then the last thing is when people think of wine, uh, it's made annually. It's marked with a vintage year, um, good or bad, you know, whatever Mother Nature throws. It's a little different with port because you or whatever organization declares a port vintage. Is that correct? And explain that for me. So we, we recognize that in the Douro, being a region that's has a lot of variation from year to year in in weather conditions that we make we, we make good wines every year but we make really outstanding wines about once every three or four years and that's been that realization gave gave, gave rise to a, a, a i think what i call a very honorable tradition which was to not to ask people every year to buy the wine like the bordelais do at the same price or higher, even though the quality may be lower. So the right. port trade from about 1870 elected to not offer the wines unless they were outstanding. And um, and this is what we call declaration. Uh, we, we declare that we we believe the wine is good enough to 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 be sold at, at the high price. And so we, we tend typically only offer it once every three or four years. Very occasionally, we'll offer two years in a row, and that happened in 2016 right. and 2017. It, it hadn't happened since the 1930s. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's it's something that, you know, um, it's a bit like, um, you know, uh, ha having favorite children. You know, you, the, the, there's, right. there's, no, there's nothing nothing wrong with either of them, but one of them might just be showing a little bit better on the day. Um, and in this case, they were both... I, you know, they were both so good. We didn't have a, a contest. So, you know. All right. Let's talk about children. One of the nice things about your business, it's a family business. Your son, Hugh, who you mentioned is in his mid twenties is working with you. Um, I hope he's bringing a younger perspective to the business. The question that I want to throw out, you know, which may 
play you into it and certainly you must be thinking about is i think port has this perception you know as an older beverage and you know the guy with the smoking jacket you know with the special glass and maybe a cigar um are you trying to and will you and how can you market port to a younger audience um i I think that's a very good question i mean i think you know i I always like to say that you know port became famous not because people put it on tv or instagram because it was good and um you know i I think that wine consumers um of, of all generations come into wine uh, at, at a at a pretty basic level, I mean, we all drink our first glass of wine when we're at college, or maybe a bit before, and then we'll probably buy. You know, we we, we drink beer at college, and then once we've got a bit of money, we will maybe buy a you know a, a, a supermarket bottle, and then once we feel comfortable about our finances, and we maybe start investing in in some more expensive you know single village wines from the Rhone, or you know, uh, and then we'll graduate to, to port. So. Uh, you know, the younger people have never drunk port. I mean, I think what we're talking about here is making sure that when those younger people who are current younger people get older, that they will drink port. And we're doing a lot of that through. So that's the know, reality of, you know, what the beverage is. You know, that's how it plays to the market. Exactly. To some but extent. I, I, yeah. I don't think that, you know, obviously we want to expose young people yeah. as early as possible to the joys of right. port. I remember having a wonderful dinner in Los Angeles a few years ago. Um, and a, a wine dinner, and this kid who she was a, maybe 22 years old just came up to me and just said, I've, I've discovered, you know, Graham's 20-year-old. 20, 20 it's, it's just, you know, this is my drink. You know, this is th- what I've been looking for all my life. And, okay, she maybe had a couple of glasses by then, but it's still <laughs> very, it was very heartening to, to hear that, yeah. you know, that, that, that somebody really, you know, of that age really engaged with, you know, the product. It, it wasn't to do with what, you know, who drank it or whether it's people in smoking jackets or it was, the, the product is really good. And I think that continues to be, so we're, you know, we're, we're making sure the packaging is getting more contemporary. The, the occasion for drinking, we're saying, look, don't, don't wait till, you know, you a birthday have a or party. right. Yeah. yeah. Just um, anytime it's a good time to drink port. So I, I, I think Hugh will be able to help you with that. All right, Rupert, we have less than eight minutes left. I need to accomplish two things in those eight minutes, so I want you to be uh, cooperative. I want you to answer my wine list. I'm going to shoot you five questions. Uh, I ask every guest the same five questions. I post them on our social media. It's always great to hear, you know, what our guests are drinking and, you know, people like you in that part of the world, you know, entrenched in port. So the first question is, what are you drinking now? What's on your table? What's in your fridge? What are you experimenting with? What are the season changes bringing? So at, at home, um, I, I'm a primarily red wine drinker. And, okay. Um, uh, I'm a Rhone nut. I love anything to do with North or South Rhone. I just, uh, I just love the whole earthiness. You, and the, you're, you know, you're preaching to the choir, Rupert. Uh, it's just I, I prefer know. Northern a little more, but love both. But it just, you know, that I, I love that rusticity and that, you know, vines that put their their roots deep to get, you know, minerals. And that, that's what I love, you know. And, and that's not to say that I haven't discovered great wines from you know, other parts of the world. But, but um, you know, I, I like to drink wine every day. I like to drink a different wine every day. And um, in living in Portugal, we don't have a huge amount of, um, of, of stuff from other regions available. Um, you know, I... When I travel to California, I typically bring back 12 bottles of right. assorted Napa California Cap. reds just to have sure. something different. And, um, and I pop up to Spain, which is only an hour from here, you know, to buy stuff at the supermarket there. And I buy Riojas and Tempranillos. Sure. And, um, but, but um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, at, at home, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'd love to be, I'd love to love white wine more, but I'm not, I'm not really sort of, you know. Um, <laughs> you sound like get, me. Got more pleasure out of the red. <laughs> no, right. Nothing against it, just not drinking enough. All right. Uh, Rupert Simington's favorite wine and food pairing. Is there something, you know, throughout that you've always loved? Don't necessarily eat it every night, every month. But what's a great wine and food pairing of yours? Okay. So my rotisserie attachment to my Weber gets a lot of use in the okay. summer. And that is a, the, the food is a is a no-brainer. And, and if you wash it down with a, a Coudelet de Bucastel from Perrin, 
Um, uh -huh. You know, that, that's an unbelievable food and wine pairing. I think that's, you know, one of the best dishes and one of the best, uh, best. I, uh, I um, agree. And I know the parents are part of the, the premium family vinay, which is a nice thing. All right. Um, help me with this. Um, you know, a lot of my guests are in and around New York, uh, the United States. You're not there. Um, your favorite wine restaurant and or bar who's somebody that's doing wine really well selection you know environment to sit down knowledgeable staff is there anything in gaia porto doro you know that stands out to you um i i have to say uh pre preaching from our own hymn sheet um we just opened a pop a pop-up restaurant with a, a local chef called Pedro Lemos, who's Porto-based chef. He's from the Doro originally, and he set up this amazing uh, bread oven that he kind of built. Ah, of, neat. Uh, neat. You know, and he's been doing, we opened this restaurant in July, um, and it's extraordinary. He's putting, you know, local uh, local duck rice you know in the oven and toasting it he even did nice. a post the other day just with a little crispy charred I mean, yeah. you know, so simple i mean there's you know there's no kind of michelin star about it it's just no it pure, sounds cool. but it just sounds brilliant it sounds you know? great all right now fourth question fourth of five uh your favorite all-time wine I always told everyone when I put this question on the list years ago, we've been doing the podcast for four years, that I was kind of fishing for people's rarest, most expensive wine they ever had. The question is more morphed into, Rupert, what's that wine that was important to you, that was transitional, that, you know, had an effect on you, still does? Um, you know, so your favorite all-time wine is really what's the wine that moved you the most or is just still that memorable? Yeah, I think... My father, about seven or eight years ago, had my three kids and, and my, my, my wife and my mother around the table. And he, he said, I've got something special. And he, he, he op he'd opened a bottle of Wars uh, 1908 um, ah. that had been in his father's cellar. And he just said, you know, I'm not sure this wasn't 2008 that he opened it. Um, and he said, you know, this is a wine that's a hundred years old. You know, I'd like you to taste this with me, you know? Um, and, and it was very emotional actually to, you know, have three generations of a wine family drinking a wine together. You know, it was probably not the greatest wine I've ever had. It was great, no, but, but it, that, but that's just, the, yeah. you understand the point of the question now? It wasn't, you know, the, the 45 Aubryon. It was, yeah. you know, that particular wine. And that's what I was looking for. The last question is, and I don't want to get into this one because I want to taste the wine quickly because we're running out of time, is I always ask my guests to recommend the best wine around $15, $20 American, a red and a white. Um, categorically, you know, there are things like Muscadet that are always cheap. What can you think of as, you know, a great value red and a great value white? Could be anywhere around the world, could be from you, could be from any other maker. Does anything come to mind? Um, I, I think um, in the whites, um, I think um, I have to say those Alsace white Rieslings uh, are just, you know, they're so undervalued and so great you know, answer. Really, you know, wines really substantial. Uh, they have the Alsatians always believe that their wines go with Chinese food, which is great. I mean, I yeah, I, they, they the wear so Tramonier too. Yeah, yeah, they go so well. And then in terms of red, um, I have to say um, a bottle of 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 my partnership with uh, Bruno Pratt's uh, Prazer de Rorige, you know, for about seventeen bucks. I mean, it's a oh, hell okay, of a good, I didn't really okay. have a good glass of wine. You know, it's um, I, it's a red. I'm glad I didn't realize it was there. And like I said, you know, I'm going to post your answers, and you know, we post specific brands. Um, great job on that, Rupert. We literally have a minute or so left. Um, every week we do a, a segment called the Weekly Wine Sip, where we get a chance to taste wine. And usually, if I have a guest that makes wine, we'll taste it. You were kind enough to drop off a Graham's twenty year old tawny porto um just tell me a little about this wine so this is a wine that's been in the barrel um since the the harvest 20 years ago it's been moved down to a porto when it was about two or three years old and it's been sitting 
in the coastal climate, which is a lot more humid and cooler than the Douro, for 20, uh, probably 24 years. And it's a wine that basically has been, been in barrels, being a higher uh, alcohol wine. It hasn't oxidized like you w- it would have done if it had been a red wine. Right. The water and the alcohol in the wine have evaporated and oxygen has come into the wine. So it's, it's gained a little bit of oxidative quality. It's gained concentration. And you get this almost liqueur-like, um, yes. you know, effect Mouth in the feel, wine. Mouthfeel, smell, you know, the, the whole the, thing. The, the primary purple fruit has morphed into raisins and, and, and Christmas pudding. And, you know, it's, it's got a lot of kind of uh, structure, but it, it, it's, it's a pale brown wine. The word tawny means literally brown. Right, um, versus the ports, which have, you know, the red, ruby red color. And exactly. The darker, yeah. Uh, and in, in terms of the nose, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's age, there's wood. Um, this is a wine you can buy. I mean, I, I went around a couple of years ago, and I, I was in a wine store casually looking at prices, and you can't get sort of second or third tier Napa wines, Cabernets, for much less than $60. No. And this wine you can buy for about 65 I mean, it's such a deal. Yeah. 20 years in the cellar and, 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 and this sort of, you know, this is a Graham 20 year old. It's, it's a, you know, I think one of my favorite, this is my go-to wine at home. I keep a bottle in the fridge all year the round. 20, um, the, the 20, even more than the 30 or the 40, you just I, like the I, way I, the 20 I, is I like settled the 20, in. The 20 still has enough of the primary fruit. You know, it, it's, it's the 30 or 40 are, are fabulous wines, but they're, right. you know, they're, they're, they're more is, of a sort of special occasion wine. Right. This, this is very this drinkable. Is a, very drinkable. What do, you, what do you pair this with or what do you drink it with? When do so, you drink it? I, I drink this typically after dinner. Um, okay, so aperitif. W- if, if I'm having it at dinner, then I recommend you have it with something like a, 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 a tart tatin or a creme brulee, something with a little caramel or pastry. That's the right. traditional. It, 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 it's such a good match. You know, this wine has been a big hit in restaurants in the U.S. because, you know, I can, I could. Chefs, I could yeah. see why. Um, yeah. It is very delicious and very drinkable. Um, that is the Graham's 20-year-old Tawny Porto. Just one last question that i got to wrap up. Is this blended vintages or it's 20 years and stays from the barrel on? This is blended vintages. So there's a master, okay. lot, a master lot, which is about 20. Okay, so years. the it's oldest tw- vintage is that. Yeah, Got so 25 year old lot, and it's kind of a mixture. And then we blend back with slightly younger wines to, to freshen right. up freshen up the blend. And right. then, but it, it, the average age of this is about 23 years, um, I right. think. Right. Yeah. It's terrific, and it is a great value. Rupert, we got to wrap up. That went very quick. I have a million more questions. Hopefully, we can get to it another time. Um, if you have a suggestion, question, wine happening, or event, hit me up at Sam at the Grape Nation.com. That's Sam at the Grape Nation. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Follow us on Facebook at the Grape Nation. On Instagram, we're at S Ben Ruby. On Twitter, we're at Ben Ruby. But you can always use the hashtag tag the grape nation on both as i mentioned we will post rupert's wine list answers um and the weekly wine sip that we sip today on our social media sites rupert if people want more information about you know any of the simmington uh wines where's the best place for them to go uh go on to uh simmington.com uh that's our main company website there's a, a simmington family estates uh, uh facebook page Instagram. Um, we, we've got lots of different, you know, it's all listed on the site, but start at Simington.com. Yeah. And, and, that, that's what and I want to say on the Simington Family Estates site, you know, we talked about Dowers, all that. Everything is prominently represented and has, you know, information on each one. So if anything we talked about, you know, is of interest to you, you go right into that Simington thing and it'll take you to wherever you want. Rupert, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of a busy life. Um, I was going to ask you how the pandemic affected you guys, but you kind of weaved in, you know, the effects it's had on you. I hope you stay safe and well. So thank you to our guest, Rupert Simington. Thank you to our engineer, Amanda, and everyone at the Heritage Radio. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. Thanks, Sam.
The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. And thanks for listening.